Now, judging from their appearance in Christmas carols and Christmas cards and pageants and plays, the wise men are among the most popular people in the Christmas story. But those same carols and cards and pageants and plays uh, have perpetrated a number of myths about the Magi. Case in point is a song we sang just a little while ago, We Three Kings of Orient Art. The Bible never calls them kings, ever. They were magi uh, or wise men who had uh, the wherewithal, the means to devote themselves to scholarly pursuits, especially the study of the stars, and also uh, gave them the opportunity to travel. They're typically portrayed as three people, a trio, uh, a threesome, but the Bible only says that they brought three gifts, not that there were three wise men. As a matter of fact, a fourth century a figure named Christostom somehow reckoned there were 14 wise men who brought three gifts to Jesus. The most, or at least one of the most important things to know about them is that they were not Jewish. They were Gentiles. Gentiles who may have traveled as far as a thousand miles in order to be in Bethlehem. Now, attempts have been made over the years to kind of write their story off as a myth, as, a, as kind of legendary material and so on, but there is nothing at all that's inherently improbable about uh, the story of the wise men, particularly if we know anything at all about the ancient world. Ben Witherington writes that there was a well-documented interest by astrologers in Persia and elsewhere in the connection between uh, astral phenomena and stuff that was going on in the skies and political events that were taking place on Earth. Roman historians describe the visit of a guy named named Tiridates and uh, a group, an entourage that traveled with him, a group of magi who traveled from the east and visited Rome. Heavenly bodies at this time were believed to herald the birth of people uh, who were born for greatness. Two Roman historians, secular historians, Suetonius and Tacitus, tell us there was widespread expectation at the time that a great world ruler would come out of Judea. So this is not, as some people suggest, an improbable story, a far-fetched story, a legend, or a, a myth at all. Astronomers have, uh, in reading this story, have been trying to identify the star uh, that is written about in the Gospel of Matthew for uh, at least 400 years now. I remember when I was a little kid, I used to go to the uh, planetarium at the Date Museum of Natural History, and every Christmas time they'd always have a special show that was on what was the star of Bethlehem. Some have suggested that it's a comet. I don't buy that because comets were typically viewed as evil omens, not as good ones. Others argued that it was a supernova. It's kind of an interesting suggestion, but the explanation that's actually gotten the most traction is that it was a conjunction of the planets Jupiter and Saturn. This is an event we know from astronomy and doing calculations and so on. This is an event that occurred three times in 7 BC. Uh, and since Jupiter was viewed as kind of the royal planet or the regal planet uh, because of its size, and Saturn was associated with Jewish people, conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn suggested that a new king was going to be born uh, to the Jewish people. The world ruler, in other words, that was widely expected to come out of Judah, was about to be born. Now, what I think about the, the wise men, I think it's kind of interesting. In an odd way, the wise men are responsible for rescuing the church of the nativity, one of, if not the oldest churches in the world, from destruction six centuries after their visit. Now, how do you rescue a place six centuries after uh, you've been there? Well, the church was spared destruction by the Persians when they invaded uh, Bethlehem in 614 AD. The reason it was spared from destruction is because there was a mosaic of the, the Magi, of the wise men, on the building's facade that pictured them in Persian dress. When the soldiers, uh, commanders, spotted these Persians uh, on the wall of, of this particular building, he ordered the soldiers to move on because obviously they didn't want to disturb anything that might have their own people inside. Now, all 
this extra biblical stuff is, is kind of interesting. But the Bible's focus actually lies elsewhere. This evening, I, I just want to briefly call your attention to three features of this story as we read about it in the Gospel of Matthew. First of all, this is a story that's meant to help us see that God's love is limitless. God's love is without limits. The God of the Bible isn't a tribal God, isn't a national God, but is a God who loves all of humankind. In the book of Genesis, God makes a promise to Abraham that he's going to be the father of a great nation, and through that nation, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And the wise men actually illustrate that promise. The wise men are not Jewish. They don't keep the Old Testament law. They don't live in the Holy Land. They live a thousand miles away, yet they are included in the story of Jesus, and they are included in uh, God's plan for salvation. They anticipate, they illustrate the inclusion of all people in the plans and purposes of God. It's exactly what we read about. Uh, this inclusive nature of the love of God. We read about the, this in uh, what's arguably the best known verse in the entire Bible, John 3.16 and 3.17. Uh, For God so loved the world, the whole world. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, nobody's excluded because of their nationality or any, anything else. Whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world might be saved through him. God's love is for everyone. That includes each one of us who's here tonight. You know, whether we know God or not, whether we're interested or not, whether we've made mistakes or not, God loves each and every one of us as if we were the only one. The Apostle Paul writes with passion. Paul's an interesting guy because Paul grows up as, um, as a Jew and uh, not kind of a uh, super religious, too. He's a, he's a Pharisee, but he becomes a follower of Jesus, and he feels called then to take the message of Jesus, not to Jewish people, but to non-Jews, to the Gentiles. And he just writes with such passion and conviction about the universal love of God in his letters. He says, for we are all baptized by one spirit. So for one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free. You know, that kind of talk is, that's crazy talk in the ancient world. This kind of talk is unprecedented in the ancient world. That everybody would be included in God's love, not just my tribe, not just my people. Um, even more remarkably, Paul writes elsewhere, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Some people try to paint Paul as, you know, this backward, uh, you know, character. In point of fact, g given the backdrop of the ancient world, this kind of talk just shows how expansive God's love is and how different the, the Christian faith is. It's what, what made it catch fire and why so many people become, became followers of Christ. The rigid categories that, that used to separate people, privileging some folks while disenfranchising others, is just declared null and void in Jesus Christ. So Paul writes in Colossians 3, here, talking about the church, here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. God's love is limitless. God's love is limitless. But 45, uh, this is kind of an interesting fact. I, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but 45 years ago today, Christmas Eve, 1968, Apollo 8 astronauts Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders were orbiting the moon. They were the first human beings ever to do that, and they were doing it on Christmas Eve. Not only that, they were, on Christmas Eve, the very first people to witness Earthrise. And it turns out this picture almost didn't happen. You've seen this picture, I'm sure, before. It's a really, really famous picture. It was taken 45 years ago today. Turns out the only reason they saw the Earth 
is because Borman, the mission commander, was in the process of rotating the spacecraft, which had been pointing nose down the whole time. I mean, they went up to explore the moon, right? So they're going to be looking at the moon. They weren't looking at anything else and didn't even know what was going on around them at the time. As they came around, Anders, the rookie of the flight, looked out the window and saw the Earth coming up over the moon. It happened three previous times on Apollo 8, but they didn't see it because they weren't in a position to see it. Anders, er, you know, Anders is just blown away by this, and he turns to Lovell and says, do you have some color film, Jim? And, and he says, quick hand me roll, and he puts it in his camera. Uh, and, and the shot, he took this shot and it became iconic. It served uh, to, to give us all a fresh new look at who we are. I mean, look at, look at the Earth. There aren't any geopolitical distinctions. There aren't any, any lines dividing peoples and nations or anything like that. Uh, it's not a four-colored map like the one I used to have in my classroom when I was in, you know, seventh grade, where, you know, England's one color and, you know, France is another and all this kind of stuff. It's just a beautiful blue planet filled with people God loves without limit. This is the way God wants us to see the world. It's his plan for the world. In addition to, to showing us the limitless love of God, the story of the Magi also illustrates how God speaks to us in our own language. God speaks in our language. Uh, a guy named Gary Chapman wrote a book a couple of years ago, uh, quite a few years ago now, called The Five Love Languages. Some of you may have read it. In this book, uh, Chapman argues that there are five basic ways that people express and experience love. One is through um, words of affirmation. You're doing a great job. I'm so proud of you. You know, I love being married to you. This kind of words of affirmation. Uh, number two, through gifts. We'll be doing a lot of uh, expressing ourselves in that love language in the next few hours. Third is through physical touch. Fourth, through acts of service. Guys, you want to give your wife an amazing Christmas present? Do the dishes tomorrow. She goes, who is this person and what happened to my husband? You know, it's because you're speaking her love language. And then fifth, quality time. Let me go over that again. Words of affirmation, gifts, physical touch, acts of service, and quality time. One of the things you might want to do is, hmm, which of those things do, is kind of my go-to? Because each, each and every one of us has his or, or her preferred love language. The deal is this, and this is the trick. The best way to show love to another person isn't by speaking in your love language. It's by speaking in their love language. Does that make sense? A guy, for instance, might think that he's showing incredible love to his kids by working overtime so that he can get them stuff. When, in fact, what they may want is more of his time and more of his attention. You know, we, we may love someone deeply. We may do things that we think are just crystal clear in terms of expressing our love to them, but they will not know that unless we uh, do that, unless we share and express our love in their love language, the, the language that speaks to them. Now, the reason I mention this is, I just think it is extraordinary how God speaks to the wise men in their love language. They're astronomy nerds. They spend all their time studying the stars and, and everything. And if God wanted to speak to them, how would he do that? You know, this is the perfect thing to get their attention. And, and the thing is, is this. If God were to speak to you, what would be the best way for him to do that? What would get your attention? What would work for, for you? Because the, the truth is, if we're to believe the Bible, God is speaking. He's speaking all the time. The Bible tells us that God is constantly communicating to us. One way he is he's communicating to us is through nature. And Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of, of his hands. I, I've always loved astronomy. And from the time I, I was a little kid, I, you know, my 
big Christmas gift, the one I remember as a kid, was when my parents gave me this really awesome telescope. And I loved, I just absolutely loved that gift. And I, I continue to follow astronomy. And whenever, you know, the, um, the Hubble uh, telescope comes back with these incredible pictures of the galaxies and all that kind of stuff, I'm all over that stuff. The heavens declare the glories of, of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. God, but God doesn't just speak to us in nature. God speaks to us in our everyday experiences. He spoke uh, to Moses while he was watching sheep. Moses, before he became, you know, Moses, um, watched sheep. He, he spoke to Gideon while he's harvesting grain, to Peter while he's cleaning his nets, to Matthew while he's collecting taxes, to the wise man while they were studying the stars. God speaks to us in our experience, in our everyday experience. Sometimes God speaks to us in our painful experiences and, and says, you know what? Um, I'm here with you and you're going through all of this stuff. You don't have to do this alone and there's a better way. He just wants to get our attention to help us and to bless us. God speaks to us through the, the people he puts in, in our lives. God's speaking all the time in our love language through the people and, and the things that matter most to us in a way that we can really understand. If we're just willing to pay attention, if we just listen. And that's the other thing about the Magi that, that's so extraordinary. They, they show us how God rewards uh, the curious and the thoughtful and the open-minded. You know, when the wise men saw the star, you know what they did? They investigated it. And, and their investigation involved them uh, kind of pulling up stakes from this place where they were really comfortable and they were in all their familiar surroundings to investigate this, this extraordinary thing, to set out on a journey, not quite knowing where it was going to lead them. And because they were willing to do that, God rewarded their efforts. My guess is that God's been trying to communicate to you as well. Probably not through a star. I get it. But I bet he's been trying to communicate to you through someone or something in your life. I guess what I want to say to you tonight is, is whoever or whatever that is, don't be afraid to listen. And don't be afraid to investigate. Don't be afraid to be open-minded about it. I mean, think about what it means uh, when we say Jesus was born. And that's why we celebrate at Christmas. Jesus is born. When you use the word born, that's a very historical word. To be born means to be in history. There's a date. There is a place. The history is all about things that have happened, events that we can actually investigate and look into and study and explore. And one of the things I would invite you to do is look into the story of Jesus. Explore it. And if you have questions about him or, or questions about the Bible or how his story fits into the claims of other great world religions or, or how it squares with the discoveries of modern science, all the better. That means you're thoughtful. Dig into it. Investigate. Look, follow where the truth leads you. Tonight, by the way, um, if, if you are, are a guest with us this evening, if you haven't done this before, be sure to stop by our welcome table. Show who's uh, playing piano tonight will be out there to, to meet you. But uh, stop by the, the welcome table tonight before you leave because we have a Christmas gift for you, and I think it's a really good one. It's Tim Keller's book called The Reason for God, which he really raises the tough questions, kind of questions you may be asking. Have fun exploring. Then again... Maybe you're not the Magi type. You're just not. Maybe you're here tonight because it's been a really tough year. And you need some hope. And you need some encouragement. And if that's you, one of the things that you need to know is that God speaks that language too. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, 
and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. A cool image for a guy who was a carpenter. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Who, whoever you are, and whatever the reason you're here, I guess the bottom line is this. I want to invite you to just pay attention. Just look around. Just listen carefully. Be open-minded. Just be receptive. Because God, whose love is limitless, is speaking to you. And he's speaking in your love language. Which is why the angel announces when the baby is born, behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Let's pray together.